Hey, it's Saoirse, and today I am so excited because I have an Amazon book haul for you. Guess how many books? If you were paying attention a couple videos ago, 18 books. I got a gift card for Christmas for Amazon, and whenever I get one, I just go on there and I look and look, and I think, what do I need? What do I need on Amazon? And then this time I just decided I'm not going to kid myself. I don't need any weird gadgets. I don't need any, like, fad things. I'm just going to get books. So this time I just got books. Right, Springer? Okay. Oh, okay. Wait, we're not going to do that. We're not going to. Okay, he's mad because he goes in these boxes and he doesn't want me messing with them. Like, I got these boxes of books, and he, as soon as I opened one, he went right in it, on top of the books, just a little cat loaf. Alright, so I've already opened the boxes, um, but let me tell you real quick. First, there was a package that came that had, like, ten books in it. They were all, like, shipped separately. So I got, like, ten books, and they were in an envelope! Like, a padded envelope. Some maniac at Amazon was having, like, a day, a day and they decided let's really screw over this person who ordered all these books and let's ship them in, a, in an envelope like a psychopath so they did and please Springer and the books were damaged of course so there were two books that I, I took out and I said can I handle this can I handle how messed up these books are and I thought about it for a few days and then I decided um, in my heart no I, I cannot handle that I can't look at this bent cover and this ripped cover and pretend that that's okay with me because I just spent money on these books so they should be perfect. They should be shipped in boxes. So luckily the other couple of shipments were in boxes and I, uh, I exchanged those two books. So we have here mostly classics because I have this massive list of classics that I just feel I need to read before I die and um, there's a lot on there that I haven't gotten to and so I can't die yet so I really need to get through some of these at least some of them and then I got a few that were I mean I guess you could call them modern classics or just modern literature um what should we start with oh I'm so excited okay but look at this can you see pretty sizable box and then there's a smaller box right there. So let's start with a small one maybe. So we have here the first one. I saw this at Barnes and Noble and I picked it up. Is the lighting okay in here? Too late, I already started. But I picked this up um, at the bookstore and I thought this looks really neat. Silence in the Age of Noise by Erling Kage. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. Is this Swedish or something? Oh, Norwegian. Sorry. Sorry, Norway. Um, it says on the back, what is silence? Where can it be found? Why is it now more important than ever? It says this Norwegian explorer, he's the first person to reach the South Pole alone, explores the silence around us, the silence within us, and the silence we must create. And by recounting his own experiences and discussing the observations of poets, artists, and explorers, he shows us why silence is essential to our sanity and happiness, and how it can open doors to wonder and gratitude. So I just thought, you know, with my anxiety being as it is, always through the roof, um, I should take a look at something like this. It looks interesting, hopefully it is, and I'm gonna smell it. If you don't smell a book when you pick it up, are you okay? Like, who hurt you? Why are you not smelling your books? Seek some help. Okay. This one, this is on my list. So I mentioned in my last video, The Perks of Being a Wallflower is one of my favorite, um, favorite books ever. And in that book, in Charlie's English class, they have this like list of reading for the year. And so I've taken that list and said to myself, I need to read all of these books. And one of them was The Catcher in the Rye, and now I've read that. I think Walden was one of them, and I read that a few years ago. And this one is on there, I believe, The Fountainhead by, is it Ayn Rand, I think? So I liked this copy, because um, it just looked 
really neat. I think it is, oh, it's Penguin Modern Classics. Um, there's so many different copies that you can find on Amazon, obviously, and in the stores, so it's a little bit stressful. I mean, honestly, like, you think I spent a lot of time on Amazon thinking, like, what should I get on Amazon? Well, you should have seen the amount of time I spent on Amazon looking at all the different editions of these books, because it is so hard to choose. They're all beautiful, but I kind of like, I kind of like the vibe of this one. Um, let me see if I should read a little bit here. It says, Architect Howard Rourke is as unyielding as the granite he blasts to build with. Defying the conventions of the world around him, he embraces a battle over two decades against a double-dealing crew of rivals who will stop at nothing to bring him down. Among them, perhaps the most troublesome of all is the ambitious Dominique Francon, who may just prove to be Rourke's equal. This epic story of money, power, and a man's struggle to succeed on his own terms is a pay- what is a pay on? To individualism and humanity's creative potential. Published in 1943. Oh, it introduced people to the philosophy of objectivism, an uncompromising defense of self-interest as the engine of progress. Sounds a little heavy. Um, I would probably not have picked this up if I read the back and like had never heard of this book. But I have heard of it. It's on my list. See, I torture myself because I don't even know if I'll like that, but it's on my list, so I have to read it. It's a classic, and um, my mom actually read Atlas Shrugged for a book club, and I don't, I don't know if I'll get to that, but hey, maybe someday. I got a few years left. Okay, this one, oh, it's a little bent, a little bent. Okay, we have Tender is the Night, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and this is, well, this is just Scribner. I didn't think it was, I thought it was like some kind of fancy edition. It's not really. I just kind of thought this was like the best cover that I could find of this book. What really kills me is that, oh, I have to dip into this box because I've got more Fitzgerald over here, is that all the Fitzgerald books didn't come in the same editions. Like they didn't even have Gatsby in these editions, which is like, what? Why would you do that? Why would you hurt us that way? Okay. Oh, it says in 1934, Tender is the Night was one of the most talked about books of the year. Oh, got a compliment from Ernest Hemingway. It says, set on the French Riviera in the late 1920s. Oh, we got a cat. Tender is the Night is the tragic romance of the young actress Rosemary Hoyt and the stylish American couple Dick and Nicole Diver. A brilliant young psychiatrist at the time of his marriage, Dick is both husband and doctor to Nicole, whose wealth goads him into a lifestyle not his own, and whose growing... Strength highlights Dick's narrow, harrowing demise. Oh, catty. A profound study of the romantic concept of character, lyrical, expansive, and hauntingly evocative. Tender is the night, blah, 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 somebody remarked, raised Fitzgerald to the heights of a modern Orpheus. Sounds fancy. Well, I really liked The Great Gatsby. I read that many years ago. Um, so I just, like, I feel like I need to read all of Fitzgerald's novels. Maybe someday his short stories. So, um, the other Fitzgerald that I got is, and I love these editions, and this is where I wanted all of the editions to be these. These are, um, vintage classics, and I just love, like, look at that. I love that. I don't know why I love it. Just, like, a simple cover. Um, so, The Beautiful and Damned. It's his second novel. It satirizes a glamorous and doomed marriage in the decadent high society of New York City in the 1920s. Inspired in part by Fitzgerald's own tumultuous union with his wife Zelda, The Beautiful and Damned chronicles the downfall of would-be jazz age aristoc <laughs> aristocats. I love that movie. Aristocrats Anthony and Gloria Patch. The novel introduces us to the pleasure-seeking Anthony is beautiful, vain, and shallow golden girl just after their marriage, when believing a large inheritance to be imminent, they begin living well beyond their means. When the expected windfall is withheld, their lives are consumed by the pursuit of wealth, and their alliance begins to disintegrate. Haunting and keenly observed, the beautiful and damned provides a vivid portrait of a lost world and the rootless and materialistic generation that inhabited it. Sounds cool. I like reading about that time period. It just seems like a really wild time. Everyone was like, what's going on here? We got all this crazy wealth. We got... I mean, it was like post-war and pre-war, and I'm not going to pretend I know anything about 
the world wars because I'm, I'm not super interested in war books and all that. But I'm just saying like that the whole 20s, 30s, it's kind of interesting to me, but I don't, I don't read a lot of it. So I'm excited to read these. Um, and the next one I have is This Side of Paradise. I probably sound really dumb right now, like talking about how I don't. I don't know anything about war stories. I'm sorry, it just isn't interesting to me. Maybe I'll find one that I like. Maybe I'll read War and Peace. Should I? I don't know. <sighs> Let's see. It says, one of the most brilliant first novels in the history of American literature. This was his first novel? I didn't know that. Um, the Side of Paradise launched Fitzgerald's literary career. Published in 1920 when the author was just 23. <sighs> Man, I'm a year older than him. What have I done? It is about the education of the youth, and to this universal story, Fitzgerald brought the promise of everything that was new in the vigorous, restless America of the years following World War I. Amory Blaine, egoistic, versatile, callow, and imaginative, inhabits a book that is interwoven with songs, poems, play scripts, questions, and answers. Okay. His growth from self-absorption to sexual awareness and personhood is described with a continuous improvisatory improv there's some improvisation, energy and delight. Far from being distracting, Fitzgerald's formal inventiveness and verve only heighten our sense that the world is being, the world being described is our own modern world. Okay. Forgot to smell some of these. Okay. Go back to this box. We have here, and this is another vintage classics edition. Tess of the, and don't get mad at me if I say this wrong, Durberville? Durberville? Der Duberville? I don't really know, but it's Thomas Hardy, and I really like this cover. I think it's so pretty. Um, I feel like I probably heard about this book. Ooh, I don't want to say this, but was it Twilight or Fifty Shades of Grey where they, they mentioned that this was, like, the main character's favorite book? That's not why I want to read it. But, um, it's classic. Let's see, Thomas Hardy lived 1840 to 1928. Good time period. It says it's one of his most famous novels. It's the story of an innocent young woman victimized by the double standards of her day. Kind of sounds like stuff that is still going on, and always will, unless we make some changes. Set in the magical Wessex landscape so familiar from Hardy's early work. Crap, I haven't read any of his work. Tess of the Durberville is unique among his great novels for the intense feeling that he lavished upon his heroine Tess, a pure woman betrayed by love. Hardy poured all of his profound empathy for both humanity and the rhythms of natural life into this story of her beauty, goodness, and tragic fate. In so doing, he created a character who, like Emma Bovary and Anna Karenina, has achieved classic stature. Sounds exciting. Okay, my camera's not dying good. <laughs> In the last video, I remember my camera died and it took me like 12 hours of really excruciating sadness trying to edit those two videos together. It was not easy and it was something I've never done, but I managed it. I just don't want to do that again. Or maybe I'll be a real YouTuber one day and learn how to edit videos and not freak out when my camera dies. Or maybe I'll just learn how to charge my camera like a normal person. So the last one in that box is The Invisible Man. And I don't know what's up with this edition. I'm not happy with it. I should have just got the one at Barnes & Noble that looked pretty cool, but I thought the cover looked cool online, but I didn't realize it was huge. Like, it's massive. Why is it so tall and wide? Like, can you see how ridiculous? Um, I have a thing about... I don't like those mass market paperbacks, the little short, fat ones. And I hate when they're these wide, tall ones. I just like the standard, what is it, trade paperback? Like, just, just the normal size, please. And this is a short book. 145 pages. Oh, and look, I can't even read you anything. Honestly, it looks like, there's nothing written on the back. It looks like one of those, like when you print your book for free or something, or like when I paid to get my book printed on the, like, espresso book machine, and there's nothing on the back or anything, because it's like, not a real published book. That's what this looks like, and so it kind of sketches me out. But do I know the story of this? I'm sure I read a 
a summary somewhere. Or a whatever. Is this, sometimes I just feel like I'm not even getting the right book. Because I, like I don't recognize the cover. It looks like somebody just printed it up at their house. I didn't think this was this. Is this really The Invisible Man? Is this what I wanted to read? Wait a second. Did I get the wrong book? Because I'm thinking of something else. Pause for a moment, please. Why am I thinking that it should have been a different author? Are there two books with the same title? Yes. Invisible. Oh my god. Well, I don't know what this one is. Maybe I just bought somebody's book. I don't know who they are, but no, I was looking for the one by Ralph Ellison. So who, what in the world is this one? Surprise, surprise. Okay, well, this is... This is the guy who wrote... What did he write? This isn't like War of the Worlds guy, right? I feel real dumb in a second. Oh, yep. War of the Worlds. The Time Machine. The Island of Dr. Moreau. I'm so confused on how I didn't know there was like, it was pretty much the same title. It says, duh. Can somebody explain this to me? Well, I guess I got this one now and then I gotta go to Barnes and Noble and get the other one. That is so weird. I have no idea what this one's about. Okay. This is what happens on Amazon. You don't know what you're doing and you just pick random things. Okay, let's move on to this big box here. We have, I've wanted this one for a while, Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. And I've really only read 1Q84 and uh, what is it? The Strange Library. Um, the what is it called? Colorless Tsukuru Tazaki and His Years of Pilgrimage. And I read um, what I talk about when I talk about running, which was his his memoir about running. And I really really liked that. I just read that like a couple months ago. Um, so I thought treat myself to this one because I want to see if I if I like more of his fiction because now I know that I like him as a nonfiction writer too. Um, so let's see. Toru, a serious young college student in Tokyo, is devoted to Naoko, a beautiful and introspective young woman, but their mutual passion is marked by the tragic death of their best friend years before. As Naoko retreats further into her own world, Toru finds himself drawn to a fiercely independent and sexually liberated young woman. It is a magnificent coming-of-age story steeped in nostalgia. It blends the music mood and the ethos that were the 60s with a young man's hopeless and heroic first love. Sounds interesting. I think I just like that it's a Beatles song. And also, I like Norway. Norwegian wood. I like forests. The woods. Did I just get it because I like the title? I think I'll like it. Okay. I think this one was another one on the perks of being a wallflower list. The Stranger. I'm sorry, can you just... Look at her. She plays with the box. Like, she goes like that on the box. She loves that. And I don't know why. Hold on. Can you see this? He's in a box. He's straight up in it. I put it over there. It's over there for five seconds and he's in it. You guys are super silly. Okay, The Stranger. Albert, I don't know if it's Camus, Camus, C-A-M-U-S. There you go. Okay. Blah, 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 since it, oh. Oh, it's French, so Albert Camus. Since it was first published in English in 1946, um, his first novel, The Stranger, or L'Etranger, has had a profound impact on millions 
on millions of American readers through this story of an ordinary man who unwittingly gets drawn into a senseless murder on a sun-drenched Algerian beach, Camus explored what he termed the nakedness of man faced with the absurd. Interesting. Okay, it says, now in an illuminating new American translation, extraordinary for its exactitude and clarity, the original intent of The Stranger is made more immediate. This haunting novel has been given a new life for generations to come. And it says he got a Nobel Prize in Literature in 1957. So I want to talk more in detail, maybe in a whole other video, about how I feel about translated works. Um, I didn't even realize it was translated. See? She's doing it. Now she's gonna pretend that she wasn't doing anything. And she's gonna walk in front of me. And now they're probably gonna get in a cat fight. Alright, keep moving, baby. So, yeah, this one's pretty short. Um, since I'm trying to read a classic a month, um, there's some months where, like, maybe the fiction or the nonfiction books I'm reading are a little bit longer, so then the, the classic that I'll throw in for the month has to be shorter so I can finish four books a month, which is what I'm trying to do. We have, my mom is excited about this one, Brave New World. She's been telling me to read this forever. Brave New World, Aldous Huxley. It says it is a dark satiric vision of a utopian future where humans are genetically bred and pharmaceutically anesthetized to passively serve a ruling order. A powerful work of speculative fiction that has enthralled and terrified readers for generations, it remains remarkably relevant to this day as both a warning to be heeded as we head into tomorrow and it's as thought-provoking, satisfying entertainment. Okay, sounds good to me. Um, I really like I've said this before, I like dystopian uh, sci-fi stuff, but I don't always like how it's carried out. I don't always like the way it's written, like those mid-century dystopian um, novels. I don't know what it is about the language they use, but it doesn't always resonate with me. Like, I didn't love Fahrenheit 451 when I read it. 1984 was a little bit better. Um, I'd like to read Animal Farm again. But anyway, I'm excited to see how this one is. Classic. Um, <clears throat> change it up a bit. I guess this is classic uh, crime. What is it? True crime. In Cold Blood, Truman Cup. I don't know if it's Capote, Capote. Maybe I should have looked this stuff up before, but just give me a break, okay? It says, on November 15, 1959, in the small town of Holcomb, Kansas, four members of the Clutter family were savagely murdered by blasts from a shotgun held a few inches from their faces. There was no apparent motive for the crime, and there were almost no clues. As Truman Capote reconstructs the murder and the investigation that led to the capture, trial, and execution of the killers, he generates both mesmerizing suspense and astonishing empathy. In Cold Blood is a work that transcends its moment, yielding poignant insights into the nature of American violence. Whew. So after reading I'll Be Gone in the Dark, I figure I can handle a little more true crime now. And, you know, I've heard a lot about this, so I'm thinking it's going to be good. I hope. Okay, um, sometimes I like to ask people, like, online, what do they recommend for me, especially classics and... This one, actually, when was this written? This is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, I think. Um, I want to say this is 20th century, 1938. Oh. Okay. Let's see. And I'm not sure I'm going to love this one based on the description, but hey. Because I see it says, um... The classic tale of romantic suspense, and I don't really read like romance, so hopefully it's more like crazy than that. It says, we're going to the windswept Cornish coast as the second Mrs. Maxim de Winter recalls the chilling events that transpired as she began her new life as the young bride of a husband she barely knew. For in every corner of every room were phantoms of a time dead but not forgotten, a past devotedly preserved by the sinister housekeeper Mrs. Danvers. A sweet, immaculate, and untouched clothing laid out and ready to be worn, but not by any of the great house's current occupants. 
With an eerie presentiment of evil tightening her heart, the second Mrs. De Winter walked in the shadow of- Hey, apparently I can only film 25 minutes before the camera shuts off, so let me finish that. Um, walked in the shadow of her mysterious predecessor, determined to uncover the darkest secrets and shattering truths about Maxim's first wife, the late and hauntingly beautiful Rebecca. So it sounds kind of gothic to me, gothic throwback, and I want to read more gothic literature. I'm excited because I got all of Jane Austen's books, and I didn't include them in the haul. They're up right there. Um, they're all the Barnes & Noble classics, and um, I didn't include them because they weren't from Amazon, so it's not part of my Amazon book haul, but I did just get all of those because there was a deal on them. And now I've got to deal with editing these two videos together, so next time maybe I won't go over 25 minutes, but there's just so many books in here. There's so many, so many books. <clears throat> Was this on the list of perks of being a wallflower? It might have been Into the Wild. I can't remember. But I read Into Thin Air. This is by John Krakauer. I read Into Thin Air and I liked it a lot. Um, so this is another of his classics. It says, In this gripping account, acclaimed journalist John Krakauer reassembles the disquieting facts of Chris McCandless's short life and searches for clues to the mystery of his untimely death. Digging deeply, he also unravels the larger riddles surrounding McCandless's case. The pull of the American wilderness, the allure that it holds for restless young men, the complex bond between fathers and sons, a cherished contemporary classic of investigative journalism, Into the Wild blazes with power and luminosity on every page. So wait, is this a classic at this point? Sometimes it's hard for me to, I mean, it, it's easy to know, like, you know, certain things, like obviously Jane Austen, classic books, um, the Brontes, classics. But when it gets more modern, I'm not always sure. And you know what? How do you, how does anybody really decide what is a classic? Like, I would say at this point, Harry Potter is a modern classic. This says 1996. I don't know. You decide. Okay, we have The Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro. And I've read... Um, Sorry, I'm tapping on things. I put on these fake nails just so I could tap on these books. <laughs> this is not an ASMR channel, but I wish it was. Um, so I read Never Let Me Go, and um, it really hit me. Like, I really, I liked it, but in a weird way where, like, I didn't love it at first, but I was like, oh, you're making a good point here, and it's well-crafted even if it's not always my style. But then I read, um, I think it's The Buried Giant, another of his books, and I almost couldn't get through it, but I always finish books, but it was hard. It was not entertaining to me in any way, or or interesting, the writing style I did not enjoy. So this could be a toss up. Could I love it, like Never Let Me Go, or could I really not like it, like The Buried Giant? If anybody wants to tell me the point I'm missing in The Buried Giant, you know, why it's good. I'm open to it. Let me know. What did I miss? Um, this says, it's a profoundly compelling portrait of the perfect English butler and of his fading insular world in post-war England. At the end of his three decades of <clears throat> service at Darlington Hall, Stevens embarks on a country drive, during which he looks back over his career to reassure himself that he has served humanity by serving a great gentleman. But lurking in his memory are doubts <clears throat> about the true nature of Lord Darlington, Darlington's greatness and graver doubts about his own faith in the man he served. I think I'm losing my voice. Um, okay. I like, oh, I like the, um, the little quotes here. Brilliant and quietly devastating. Quietly devastating is one of my favorite phrases. A perfect novel, I couldn't put it down. Ooh, a story both beautiful and cruel. So I like all the sound of that. Um, ooh, I don't like the font though. Ooh, yeah, I want to do a whole video about font, but this is like one of those old fashioned looking fonts. See it? And uh, it looks like the letters are just like close together and like a little blurry. I don't know. Ugh. We'll see. Maybe it'll be okay. Um, let's see. <sighs> We have The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins. So somebody recommended this to me. And 
I think it's Victorian, that's why. Because I was asking for, like, mostly Victorian books. Um, because, like, I studied a lot of Victorian literature, but mostly it was, like, just the Brontes. Pretty much the, the Brontes and Elizabeth Gaskell. Um, and then, like, Oscar Wilde and Bram Stoker. Um, yeah, but I need, I need more Victorian books in my life. So I really don't know what this is about. What does it say? The Moonstone, a yellow diamond looted from an Indian temple and believed to bring bad luck to its owner, is bequeathed to Rachel Verinder on her 18th birthday. That very night, the priceless stone is stolen again, and when Sergeant Cuff is brought in to investigate the crime, he soon realizes that no one in Rachel's household is above suspicion. Hailed by T.S. Eliot as the first, the longest, and the best of modern English detective novels, the Moonstone is a marvelously taught and intricate tale of mystery in which facts and memory can prove treacherous and not everyone is as they first appear. Oh, it says it's a work of Victorian sensation fiction. Early example of the detective genre. Discusses the technique of multiple narrators, the role of opium, and Collins's sources and autobiographical references. Oh, that's in the introduction that talks about that stuff. Um, Okay, so I don't usually read, like, detective stuff, I'm not really into that, but, um, sometimes it works for me, and if it's Victorian, hey, it might be more interesting to me. Um, so that sounds good. And then this one, this is the last one, I saw this book in a store years ago, and I just loved the cover, but then I never bought it. Look at that cat! Would you look at that cat and his little tongue? little snake tongue. Look at that. Okay, it's The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. And it's obviously translated from Russian, I would assume. Um, so this could be a toss-up. I don't know. I, I don't think I've read any Russian literature. And uh, when was this even written? It could be really hard for me to get through. We will find out. 1967? Could that be right? It says, one of the most important and best-loved modern classics of world literature. The Master and Margarita has been captivating readers around the world ever since its first publication in 1967. Written during Stalin's Simon Power, but suppressed in the Soviet Union for decades, Bulgakov's masterpiece is an ironic parable on power and its corruption, on good and evil, and on human frailty and the strength of love. In The Master and Margarita, the devil himself pays a visit to Soviet Moscow. Accompanied by a retinue that includes the fast-talking, vodka-drinking, giant tomcat behemoth, he sets about creating a whirlwind of chaos that soon involves the beautiful Margarita and her beloved, a distraught writer known only as the Master, and even Jesus Christ and Pontius Pilate. The Master and Margarita combines fable, fantasy, political satire, and slapstick comedy to create a wildly entertaining and unforgettable tale that is commonly considered the greatest novel to come out of the Soviet Union. It appears in this edition in a translation by Mira Ginsburg that was judged brilliant by Publishers Weekly. Wouldn't be sad if you were a translator and, and nobody thought your translation was brilliant? So, I mean, yeah, like I said, this could go either way, I don't know. I, I don't think I ever even, like, fully read the back, because I was reading that just now and I was like, what? There's a giant cat? That sounds cool, but... Like, I used to read a ton of fantasy, and now I read a lot more just, like, realistic fiction. I've gotten a little boring, and I'm hoping that I can suspend disbelief a little bit and read some crazy things. Because look at that crazy cat. It doesn't get too much crazier than that, does it? Look at that cutie. I hope he's a good boy. I don't know. I'll have to find out and let you know. Oh, so when am I going to get to all of these books? That's the question. 18 new books. Where am I going to put these? Look, what have I got? Have I got any room on my shelf? Uh, I've got like a shelf down there. Um, I don't have much room, but I have like two kind of open shelves, like things that I'm putting knickknacks on, so I should be able to fit everything. So here's some stacks of books. Very exciting to get such a big book haul. Um, 
and to have gotten it all for free from using a gift card. Didn't have to use my own money. Look at all those books. Isn't that beautiful? You know what else is beautiful? This cat. He's still in the box and he's sleeping now. See, at least he's not walking all over what I'm trying to do. Now he's just sleepy. And Caddy walked off. She was done playing with the box, I guess. So I think that's all that I'm going to do in this video. Um, I hope that was mildly entertaining for you guys because I know I'm entertained by seeing all these books and tapping on them. That's what I do like in bookstores now. I have to smell the book, give it a good tap. Does it sound good? Does it smell good? Okay, then I can get it. Um, so other than like getting the wrong book, like The Invisible Man, I don't know how I didn't... Like, I thought something seemed off, but I have no idea what this is. Surprise. Um, so, yeah, I think, I don't know when I'll post this video, but I'll be back with some more book thoughts next time, I'm sure. And I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. Bye.